Well, it's been a pretty wild last few weeks of arguing in the comments section of the previous videos in this series, and I've learned a few things that I'd like to share with you to help you while doing intellectual battle with the final vanguard of Dark Age scientific thought. First off, and this should not be a big surprise to anyone, creationists can be a little bit touchy about their intellectual prowess. Most creationists seem to believe that simply because I poke fun at them in my videos, that I assume that they are all inherently stupid, probably with an IQ of about 75 or something, which would of course only be considered normal for white supremacists. Some will even go so far as to tell me what I think of their intellect before I've ever even talked to them, which is somewhat amusing, but come on creationists, I know you can muster up more self-esteem than that. I don't generally see creationism as something caused by low IQ. Creationism is caused by ignorance or by fear. It's either ignorance of science or fear of eternal punishment because they believe it conflicts with what their deity wants them to believe, or it conflicts with a worldview, or whatever other non-evidence-based reason they have. The exact reason is important, though, because ignorance is relatively easy to fix, but faith-based science is a lot more difficult. This leads me to my first tip of this video, which is getting to the bottom of a creationist's objections. I've sometimes found it helpful to get to the source of their science denial. No amount of arguing about the details of fossils and DNA is going to help if the person you're arguing with has it in their head that evolution is evil and they're going straight to hell if they believe it. If this is their position, then this could end up an entirely different kind of argument that has very little to do with science at all. The problem is that you'll spend eternity arguing about whether an invisible man wants them to believe this or not, and by the time you're done, you'll have gotten nowhere, and you'll want to gouge your ears out with a dull butter knife. You can always debate any willing partner if you want to, of course, but please, do your poor ears a favor and at least consider your sanity before jumping into such a debate with these underlying assumptions on their part. I'll give you an example of a couple of questions you can ask to help determine if an argument is worth it. I'll demonstrate on Cletus the creationist here. Hi Cletus, are you ready? If you can get this question correct, you can qualify to argue against evolution. Alright, all right, Eric, I I'm ready. Okay, Cletus, the question is, what is a mutation? Oh, oh, I, I know this one. It it's something bad that happens, and then you're born with two heads or something. Oh, I'm sorry, Cletus, that's incorrect. Mutations are random changes in the genetic code, and so that can be helpful, harmful, or neither. Okay, Cletus, I know that was a hard question for someone who hasn't taken any science classes since ninth grade, but you'll be happy to know that I have a bonus question to test your logic skills outside the topic of evolution. If you get this multiple choice question right, you can still qualify to debate against evolution. Oh, okay, I I'm ready. Give it to me, man. Okay, here's your question. Pick whichever options you feel apply. What is the best indication of whether or not the Earth's climate is warming? Your choices are A. Over 100 years of temperature data gathered from thousands of locations worldwide. B. Whatever the temperature is where you live on the coldest day of the winter. Or C. Whatever Glenn Beck says. Oh, oh, I, I know this one. I, I know it. Okay, great. So what is your answer, Cletus? Both B and C. That's right. Oh, I'm sorry, Cletus. The answer was A. You don't qualify to argue anything involving science or evidence. You just aren't logical enough. We do have some lovely parting gifts, though, and thank you for playing. Oh, man. Poor Cletus. Oh well. If Cletus had gotten one of those questions right, though, he might have thrown the old transitional forms argument at you. It's one of the oldest in the book. This can rapidly turn into a never-ending loop of, yes there are, and no there aren't. Here's how to avoid this. First of all, show them the video that I have over in the sidebar, or any one of dozens of others like it on YouTube, or a paper in the scientific literature. If that doesn't seem convincing enough to them, get into specifics. Ask them exactly what two animals they want to see a transition of in order to prove that there are transitional forms. Have a phylogenetic tree handy and trace the two animals back to their common ancestor. I've linked an example or two of a phylogenetic tree in the sidebar. Point it out and tell them that this is the common ancestor based on the DNA and fossil evidence. There's probably no mixture of the two animals, of course, because that's not how evolution works. If they're still looking for something like a crocoduck, ask them what part of evolution would predict such a thing. They'll have no answer because, of course, evolution doesn't predict that at all. Believe me, I'd love to have a pet crocoduck, though. Can you imagine the next time Jehovah's Witnesses came to my house? <laughs> oh, that must be them now. 
Finally, I just wanted to share a humorous creationist question that I got on a video recently. A creationist asked me for my thoughts on primordial soup. Well, that deserves an answer, though it's very telling when someone couches most aspects of science in terms of opinion, isn't it? Hmm. The answer is... Hmm. Nom nom nom. I love primordial soup. Hmm. My pet crocodile just cooked up a batch for us. It's great. It's full of amino acids, really nutritious. Actually, hmm. Almost tastes like there's a little blood in it or something. What did you put in this exactly? Oh, sh-